Nostalgia, and I say this without irony, is making a comeback. In fact, it's become dominant in public culture. From the Star Wars sequels, to Pokemon Go, to Friends being among the most streamed shows on Netflix, a person could be forgiven for forgetting it isn't the 90s anymore. What's fueling this nostalgic turn, and how are some working to harness its power? Let's ask, in Montreal, Quebec, via Skype, Katharina Niemeyer. She is a professor of media theory at the University of Quebec in Montreal. And here in our studio, Ed Conroy, founder of Retro Ontario, an online archival museum of Ontario-based culture. And Angus Tucker is here. He's chief creative officer with John Street Advertising. And we are delighted to welcome you two here to our studio at Young and Eglinton. And Katharina, it's nice to have you on the line from Hello. La Belle Province. I want to, Ed, get us started here. Why does nostalgia seem to be having such a moment right now? Well, the unsexy answer uh, is that it's strictly economics. Uh, it costs so much money now to make a film, to make a television series, that the producers and the bean counters want to guarantee that there will be a return on their investment. And so by using the power of nostalgia, you can pretty much guarantee that a certain segment of the audience will show up. So whether it's a sequel or a reboot, they know there's a built-in audience. So it's not great for people looking for original content, but it's great for people who like to relive the content of their youth. Well, that's it, Katerina. It presupposes that there's something about, if it's music, the soundtrack of our life from earlier times, if it's movies, those movies we grew up with, it presupposes there's something about reconnecting with all of that that we like. What is that? Yeah, so of course, um, Ed is right. There is something about, uh, of course, economy and marketing related to nostalgia. But it's also something we can observe right now is uh, like three things maybe which might uh, explain this nostalgia boom. Um, it's like the social acceleration of time we are yeah, now like experiencing uh, at some point with the World Wide Web going faster, our communication technology. So nostalgia is also a way to slow down our everyday life. That must be one first thing to, to name. A second one is also that we are in a moment of crisis or change from an economic point of view and a uh, very mindful point of view. So nostalgia is a way of coping with change. And maybe a th third point is that um, there is an accumulation of the past, also of our media past. So contents and objects of popular culture um, are a bit easier accessible, can be shared online, etc. So there's a new access to the past coming up with new technologies and the World Wide Web helping us at some point to, to access it. So a that might be maybe three points to name, oh. yeah. Okay, Angus, I want you to uh, do the impossible here. I want you to get in my head for a second. Okay. Every time I hop into my car nowadays, mm -hmm. every time I turn on Sirius XM radio mm -hmm. and I'm playing the Johnny Carson channel. <laughs> they have a whole channel now devoted to Johnny Carson shows, all of which I saw 40 years ago when they aired for the first time and I'm right. listening again and I don't even know why. Why is nostalgia so powerful? I think because of climate change. Um, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Not actually <laughs> climate change, but I think um, as uh, Katerina was saying, um, one of her points was we're living in a age of anxiety right now. People are freaked out about climate, oh, climate change. Climate change, there you go. Um, politics is a bit nutty right now, uh, whether it's Brexit or, or Trump or whomever it happens to be. Uh, the economy isn't, there's a great deal of uncertainty, I think, going on in, in our country and, and around, around the world. And nostalgia is, is comforting. It's something that we have just by definition been through. We survived it, we made it, and maybe the bad parts of that actual experience have, have lessened over time and we now look at it through rose-colored glasses. So I think, I think one of the reasons it's having its moment is it's just, it's, it's nerve-wracking just waking up uh, on Wednesday morning. And I can days. be 16 again when I listen to Johnny Carson. And you can, and you can tell your kids there was an, actually a guy that people would watch at 11, or what time it was? 11.30. Anyway, 30. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah. And he was great. He was and great. And he did it for 30 years. He did. And that's why I'm still listening. Katharina, where does the term nostalgia come from in the first place? Well, I will try to be short. It's, um... From historically, it's from the 17th century, 1688, actually. It was Johannes Hofer, a Swiss doctor, who invented the notion. It's from Greek origin, of course. Uh, it means nostos, uh, uh, nostos and al, uh, alja. 
So Nost is going home and Alja is suffering. And it means basically homesickness and described the described actually, yes, the, the homesickness of the Swiss mercenaries who had to leave their country. So it comes from there and it got out of the medical discourse by the beginning of the 20th century because it was too much confused with melancholia and also depression. And then it got more and more into popular culture in the 20th century with a quite negative connotation, to make it very short. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. And what yeah. triggers it in you? Well, I, I mean, I think there's a number of, of trigger uh, items. I think music and, and sounds are, are, are amongst the most triggering. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you were saying you get in your car, you can hear a song that you maybe haven't heard for 25 years, and you're magically transported back to that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be certainly overpowering. I, I think the sense of smell, uh, you know, I don't know if you ever go and use bookstores, but there, there's sort of a smell of history in there, which is which is quite amazing. Um, and then the seasons. I mean, <clears throat> people talk about the autumn being, uh, for whatever reason, this very triggering season yeah. where we sense change. You know, it's happening literally, um, but we're also feeling very nostalgic about going back to school or Halloween or any of those things. We had joy, we had fun, we had seasons in the sun. <laughs> That's right. Do you know what I'm referring to of there? Of course. You do, sure. okay. Sure. <laughs> Yes. You do too? Yeah, Terry okay. Jacks. Terry yeah. Jacks, good for you. Massive. Yeah. Now that song's, how old is that song? That's 40. Early 70s. It's gotta be, exactly, early 70, 70, 40, 40, 45 like years old. Yeah. 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 Oh boy. Okay. How is it, uh, Katharina, help us with this. Why, how do you see it playing out in popular culture today? Well, I would like to go back to what Ed was saying because it's a direct link, link to popular culture actually because the Swiss mercenaries who were sick, they could be healed like with media and communication tools because music from their home country or the, the accent of their, of, uh, of their language helped them actually to reconnect at distance. So this is actually, exactly the point. Media and communication tool are tools for healing nostalgia at some point or coping with change and mm. the social acceleration and anxiety. And this is actually shown currently in psychological research or in communication media studies and popular culture, of course, the objects, well, the smell, uh, the materiality, um, the songs, the music, every kind of these things, yeah, are quite um, well, close to what nostalgia basically is and uh, what could be healed with. So, um, so the current popular culture boom, I think, related to, uh, around nostalgia is also what I have said in the beginning, that there's an accumulation of the past which becomes accessible. Our media past, we can be nostalgic for it, but also the media industries themselves. Um, yeah, and popular culture is something of, out of everyday life, the moments we share with family, the, with friends, etc. So um, there's, a, there's a big place for uh, popular culture in our everyday life and so also for the nostalgia which can be related to it. Angus, how do you figure that the TV show Friends, which was on 20 plus years ago, has made a massive comeback with a whole new generation? Um, I, it, it, it's an interesting question, um, but I, I think it largely has to, I think the internet has an enormous um, effect on that. Um, you no longer have to have lived through an era to experience it. Huh. You can go back and watch the entire, you know, eight seasons of, of Friends on a Weekend if you don't sleep and you just really <laughs> commit to it. It's a lot of shows. Uh, yeah, and um, so I think, I think just the availability of, of all those different eras is, is you know, uh, uh, your fingertips away. I think the second reason um, is that, uh, oh my God, I forgot what the reason was, and it was so good, I totally forgot. <laughs> it'll, uh, it'll come oh, right, yeah, no, I know. Okay. Um, it's this uh, a, a partner of mine, he just, he just calls it age fluidity. Um, which I thought was a nice sort of soundbite, which is why I forgot it. But uh, he just said that, you know, it used to be, you know, you, you're, the ages that you lived through, they were much more defined. And once you got to a certain age, you no longer did a certain thing. Um, and I think, again, the internet has an enormous influence on that. But it seems that, you know, a 55-year-old can experience life to a certain degree as a 15-year-old or a 25-year-old. And vice versa, kids are listening. You know, you hear so much um, classic 70s rock on, you know, my own kids' playlists, you know, mixed in with contemporary stuff. But this fluidity of um, culture and age and generations just seems far greater 
than it did, you know, a generation ago. Age fluidity. Yeah, that's a good age expression. fluidity. It's and, trademarked and, by my partner. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to pick up on that, I think there's an element uh, of infantilism that that is encouraged yes. almost, where you have, you know, in the old days, certainly you were encouraged when you hit a certain age to put away your childhood toys and put it all away and forget about it and grow up and you know be a man and certainly the wartime that was that was a big part of it and and whereas now uh you, you see these sort of men in their 50s wearing their star wars pajamas and they don't care <laughs> you know it's it's who they are they're celebrating it and i think that's great yeah you i have to say you have a website that is both seriously fabulous and seriously nerdy like you <laughs> focused on ontario Retro culture. How'd right. you get into that? Well, I grew up in Ontario. Uh, and uh, in, in addition to growing up and, and being a big consumer of, of, the, of our cultural output, um, I saw a, a real lack of excitement about some of the incredible things that had happened uh, in popular culture in Ontario, including at this very network, uh, TV Ontario. Mm -hmm. You had people like uh, Jim Hanley and Heather Conkey and Elwi Ost and Clive Vanderberg uh, creating wonderful programs and, and programs for children and programs for grown-ups. And there really wasn't much on YouTube. This is 20 years ago yeah. or 10 years ago. Um, and I just saw a real niche that I thought needed to be filled. I happened to have a, a, an extensive media collection and the advent of social media was perfect because it allowed me to exhibit it and, uh, and share it because it really that going back to that idea of, of the communal experience and reliving all of this stuff, uh, the internet allowed that, which it didn't before. Before you would be considered a hoarder if you had all these things <laughs> in your basement. Okay, right. do, do, you, do you make money doing it? No, it's, it's a not-for-profit. Um, I do a lot of research and writing and, and also producing my own shows, so there, there is some revenue there. But it's, it's uh, not an attempt to infringe on anyone's copyright. It's, it's the opposite. It's to celebrate this material and, and bring attention to the wonderful work that was mm. done. Katharina, let me refocus on the, the sort of political tenor of our times. Uh, these, are, yeah. these are different times, right? Uh, look who's in the White House. Look what's happening in the United Kingdom. Look what's happening across much of Europe. Uh, we just had a very unusual election ourselves in this country. Is there something about today's political climate that makes us particularly susceptible to nostalgia? Well, um, this is a very tricky question. Um, to be the more neutral possible, I would say that um, in every country, um, we can now observe a type of a coming back of what could be form a political utopia or ideas what the political future could be. Um, and there is where also the, how to say, the, the danger lies for what nostalgia basically is, because nostalgia is a very fragile feeling too, because people who are deeply nostalgic, that does not mean actually that they are not creative, uh, that they are just digging into the past, because nostalgia is really related to the future too, and the imaginations of the future we have. So um, for, uh, in politics, it has always been used nostalgia, but the deep nostalgia, which is rooted, I'm talking about the homesickness and the question of identity, was quite often abused by politicians in history and still is today. And I think the populist ideas, but also other types of uh, political orientations can use the feeling of the voters like, yeah, to, to get elected. And this is something where in, 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 in politics there has to be attention paid. And when we look, there will be soon the, the 30 uh, years of the fall of the Berlin Wall. There's also this type of nostalgia um, in, in, in former GDR, in the former, former um, communist part of Germany. So mm -hmm. as you can hear, I was born in Germany, actually. So and there also you can observe this kind of uh, political nostalgia coming back for a past, which was maybe uh, most of the time not better. And this is also what this famous Make America Great Again. I mean, was it so great? No, I don't think so. It's an idealization of the past. So yes. I would say it's quite used in politics. Well, that's interesting. Angus, I want to follow up with you on that because much of the nostalgia we've been talking about so far gives yeah. us a sort of a warm, yummy feeling. Yeah. But if you take nostalgia, as some forces in Germany, for example, have, to recall what they would consider to be a better time, but which mm -hmm. most of the rest of the world considers to be the worst time in human history, yeah. Nazi Germany, when you look at what nostalgia has turned some of America into today, how fearful should we be about nostalgia if it's in the wrong hands? Well, I think it all depends on the hands that are wielding it. Um, you know, 
Donald Trump is a, is a skilled user of nostalgia. Um, you know, as Katerina said, Make America Great Again is about the most nostalgic campaign line um, uh, I've ever heard. Um, and it's, it's incredibly effective with the people that he's talking to. Um, people who um, feel like they've been left behind by the new economy uh, and are sort of hearkening back to back when America was, you know, their idea of America, um, which was, uh, you know, something that um, probably just isn't possible anymore. Yeah. Ed, um, let me get a quick follow from you on that. I know much of what you're involved in is, is hearkening back to kind of people's childhood and enjoying those fun times, but how worried do you get about nostalgia in the wrong hands? I don't worry about it at all. In fact, I think we've seen this play out before in, in the 70s, right? I mean, there's a lot of histronics about the, things are so bad now, but really, if you look back, uh, a lot of this same stuff was happening in, in the late 70s. And ironically, you had a guy called George Lucas come along uh, and make a movie called American Graffiti. And American Graffiti was all about lionizing the 1950s. And so you had that first kind of wave of, of going back 30 years and, and reliving that. And it, yes, it was an antidote to the, to the dark times, but it, 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 you cannot underestimate the good intentions of nostalgia. I don't think uh, it can be wielded in a negative way. Well, let's try this with advertising. I, I presume that, that uh, taking a nostalgic approach mm -hmm. with your clients in certain circumstances is the way to go if, it, if you want to help get a message out or get a brand out yeah. or a product or whatever. Give us some insight into how you do that. Well, I think you, I think you can use nostalgia effectively because, um, you know, great advertising is trying to evoke uh, emotion. It's trying to evoke a feeling uh, about uh, a, a brand or a, or a, or a thing. Um, but if it's just nostalgia, if you're just going back and there's no relevance to today, to 2019, then I think it can kind of be empty. Um, if you just look back and go, oh, that's what life was like 40 years ago, but there's no possibility of that you know, being recreated now, then it's just kind of a, a look back. Okay, I'm gonna, um, I'm so gonna do that's something. The, that's the thing you have to uh, balance. Watch, uh, I'm gonna do something that Johnny Carson used to do 40 years ago all the time, <laughs> which is to say, uh, you wanna set up this clip that we're about to see? Cause you oh, brought, sure. a, you, oh, okay. you brought a clip of something. Oh, yeah, we got okay. the clip. Okay, we got the clip. Do you, do you wanna tell us a bit about what we're about to see? Sure, okay, so uh, this is a, uh, a spot, a TV spot that we did, it, it, longer than most. It was two and a half minutes long. It aired on uh, January 1st of 2017, the first day of Canada's uh, 150th birthday. Uh, it's for our, um, one of our clients, President's Choice. It was one of the big, or the biggest food brand in Canada. They wanted to be about more than just food, uh, so this idea launched this whole eat together uh, movement. Ooh, cool. um, As Johnny would say, "Let's uh, watch the monitor here in right, the studio and we'll out. play a okay. snippet of this." Sheldon. <laughs> Great work there. That's just great. Why that Thank song? You. Um, well, we were trying to come up, whenever you're coming up with a, a song to accompany a piece of film, you're trying to think of something that works conceptually to the idea. And what you didn't see in that uh, video was the, the lead up to it, which was the, the young woman who's the protagonist of the whole thing. She's going into her apartment, she rides up the elevator, walks into the hall of her apartment, surrounded by other people in this building, and no one's talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Everybody's just staring at their phones, We've all, it's basically life in 2019. Um, and what she decides to do is she has a roommate, she and her roommate just go, okay, we're having an impromptu dinner party in the hallway and let's see who jumps in. Um, so uh, we were just looking for a, a song that lyrically supported this idea of connection and community. So, you know, we had a bunch of them that we looked at, but the, the classic 
Burt Bacharach, Burt Bacharach uh, yeah. from the late 60s, mm -hmm. early 70s. It just, it just fit. Um, we re-recorded it with a different artist, but you know, it's not a, a wildly contemporary version of that song. But I think that particular song and the feelings that that evoked for people who've actually knew the song, you brought all that good stuff into it. For, for people that didn't, they went, that's oh, a lovely song. Ed, a couple of years ago, when the country and the province turned 150 years old, they brought back the old give us a place to stand and a place to grow, and they re-recorded it. New, new, how, how do you think all that worked out? I mean, I think that's one of the greatest pieces of, of, of you know, proud uh, Ontario music that was ever written. Uh, Dolores Clayman, who, of course, also wrote our other national anthem, the Hockey Night in Canada theme. Uh, and, you know, know D Dolores is a, just a wonderful writer, and I, I think we need more of that because that's, that's the light, right? That's the positive, uh, make us all feel good mm -hmm. about being part of Ontario, a place to stand, a place to grow. I think some people look at that stuff and they maybe are a bit cynical about it. They think it's a you know, cheesy old song from Expo 67 and who cares about it, uh, which is why I think it's important that it's reinterpreted. You know, yeah, yeah. I think it's important to fr freshen it up, but the ideal of that is still as timely now as it was then. If, Katharina, if I, if how do you... Sorry, can jump in. We yeah. actually did that spot. Oh. You did? Yeah. Good man. Yeah, we did. I didn't yeah. know that. Well yeah. done. Yeah. Oh, that was Thank terrific. You. Katharina, how do you see companies capitalizing on nostalgia? <laughs> well, it's completely understandable at some point because nostalgia has always worked uh, also like a communication tool and as an advertising tool, as just Angus said, but it has to be used in a quite intelligent way to make it function. Um, at, uh, at the other side, I would say from the media industry, for instance, like Netflix, Netflix is quite nostalgic in its business strategy. Oh. Um, that does not mean that all the viewers are nostalgic. We can't think that uh, all the audience is like um, just like thinkable or preformatable at some point. I'm inventing words, sorry, but uh, I mean just the, the, the public's intelligence. So if you have like a, a nostalgic content or nostalgic aesthetic, that does not mean that people getting nostalgic watching it. But of course, as nostalgia has always been a business and nostalgia always um, yeah, offered the possibility to make money because it's a very, uh, very intensive feeling, yes. Well, let's do another one here. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. I think we've got time to show this. Sheldon, you want to bring these pictures up here? This is uh, the no-name brand. Uh, everybody remembers from back in the day, the no-name brands. And uh, I guess they're back again, just like a long lost friend, all those times you knew so well which is a Carpenter's lyric, but never, <laughs> never mind. They never went away, I know. Uh, this is you again, eh? Yes, it is. Okay, yes, it tell is. us about this. Why do you think this works? Well, it's, it's, it works in its kind of brutal simplicity. Um, this is a, uh, No Name is a brand that's been around since the 70s, uh, designed by Don Watt, and it was meant to epitomize frugal shopping. Um, yellow, I think if, if designer was in the room, he'd, um, he or she would say that it's a, it's a very frugal, it's a very sort of cheap color. Mm -hmm. um, and it was meant to just be a very stripped down uh, line of products um, that allowed you to save money on your grocery bill. So we just applied that same aesthetic to it, um, but instead of packaging products, we just essentially packaged the city under the same aesthetic. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, uh, th this has been a very nostalgic discussion. I want to thank you all for coming in and talking to us about it. You want to give us your website so that if people want to get all retro about Ontario, they know where yes, to go? Yes, please. Come check us out. We're at uh, retroontario.com. How do you spell that? One O R E T R O N T A R I O. Do you pronounce it Retro Ontario? Retro Ontario. It's a, it's a uh, portmanteau, right? Because Retro Ontario, two words, but if you stick them together, the two O's look a bit goofy. So <laughs> one O is better than two. Gotcha. One o and and in, in terms of nostalgia, I should point out TVO's 50th anniversary. 50th, 50th anniversary this year. So we're going to be celebrating 50 years of. So you may see some nostalgia around these parts as well. Is Pokeroo going to make an appearance? I, I can't talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a national security secret. <laughs> Katerina Niemeyer, it's awfully good of you to spend some time with us tonight on TVO. We thank you for joining us. Uh, you're with the University of Quebec in Montreal. Ed Conroy, Angus Tucker here in our studio in the Big Smoke. Great to have you all on TVO tonight. It was a pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.